Let me once again welcome everyone to our webinar on Insights on Global Collaboration, prepare for the 2014 IUCN World Parks Congress. Today's event is co-sponsored by Harvard University's Conservation Innovation Forum and the Government Innovators Network at Harvard Kennedy School's Ash Center for Democratic Governance and Innovation. Moderator is James Lovett, Director of the Program on Conservation Innovation at the Harvard Forest and a fellow in the Department of Planning and Urban Forum at the Lincoln Institute of Land Policy. Jim will be starting us off today. Good morning. It's a beautiful, crisp day in Cambridge, Massachusetts. I think we're, uh, we have one of our first days where there's frost on the ground, and we're excited to have you all here. There are about 25 people in this um, chat room, including those presenting as well as attendees. And we're here to focus on what we, I believe, the largest conservation conference in the world, which will be held next year in Australia. We're honored to have two groups of speakers with us today. First, Will Stephen Woodley, who is a senior advisor to the International Union for the Conservation of Nature, or the IUCN, which is the convener of this uh, World Parks Congress in Sydney. And then we'll hear from Krista Valentino and Elaine Sao, who are young professionals helping to organize the stream of the World Parks Congress that focuses on participation by young professionals and youth around the world. I uh, will turn to Stephen in just a moment, but I want to mention to everyone who's on the call the Lincoln Institute and the, uh, the program on conservation innovation at the Harvard Forest have just issued a call for papers uh, from students and young professionals who are on large landscape conservation. We hope to take the authors of a handful of the best of the papers submitted uh, to a, a, a session in uh, Massachusetts. Well, we will take those papers and turn them into products that can be published on, on popular publications around the world and be to give a travel stipend to the authors of those papers so that they can attend and present their ideas to the World Parks Congress in Sydney next November. So hopefully it's a, a very exciting prospect for some people who have new ideas about how to push the conservation paradigms of today into the future. Uh, and we have today three people who have been thinking about that for quite a while. So we begin by calling on Stephen Woodley. I've had the pleasure of meeting Stephen several times, and he uh, brings with him scientific insight from Parks Canada and a huge passion for conservation around the world. He is an inveterate traveler. He, you don't know when you call him if he's going to be in Poland or Costa Rica, uh, but he's working very hard towards the goal of having an outstanding World Parks Congress there. So, Stephen, with that, uh, let me begin uh, by asking you what I ask most of the people who come on the webinar series, which is, can you tell us briefly how you got inspired to get into the field of, of conservation in the first place, and then we'll, we'll click over to your presentation. All right, Jim. Thank the Lincoln Institute, and, and thank the Harvard Kennedy School for uh, for putting this on. Um, I guess I come from a pretty traditional connection to nature. It was really family based and, and we spent our our growing up years uh, outdoors uh, camping and fishing and uh, and canoeing and I've always wanted to work in uh in nature and uh and I did. I was one of the few people I knew who didn't change their professions. Lucky to be able to do it I think. Well lucky to have you here. You have a uh a slide pack that's up on the screen now, uh, conserving biodiversity uh, with a UCN logo. Why don't you take us through that? All right, I would start with with brief, um, to briefly by saying what the IUCN is, because it's not um, particularly well known inside the U.S. Yeah, even in the conservation community. So the the IUCN is uh, the International Union for the Conservation of Nature is the oldest um, 
protected area organization, I think, in the world, at least of the modern protected area organizations. It was founded in 1948 when they were reorganizing global governance after after World War II. And I'm not even sure if we'd be able to form it today it, because it's a mix of state and NGO members. There are 60 countries that are members. And uh, there, there are 1,200 uh, NGOs that are members of, of this unique uh, organization. All at global conservation. Uh, it, um, in addition to that, it has uh, observer status on the UN, so so it's a well-connected organization. But around it, around that membership, are commissions, and there are commissions representing lost species, protected areas, education, uh, social justice. Uh, and these are made up of volunteer professionals from around the world, of which there's more than 11,000. The commission I'm going to be speaking about mostly today is the World Commission on Protected Areas, and that is the lead organization which is uh, organizing this World Parks Congress. So before we get into that, just a little background on protected areas. Protected areas are our largest tool globally to to conserve diversity. If you look at the CN definition of protected areas, first and foremost is these areas are set up to conserve biodiversity. And I think in our busy world, uh, busy, ur increasingly urbanized world, we forget that biodiversity is essential to keeping us alive. Uh, it provides shelter, food, recreation, inspiration, but essentially we're part of this integrated ecosystem that keeps us alive. So loss of biodiversity, which we're going to focus on at this uh, World Conservation Congress, is is fundamental. It's fundamental to our very future, um, uh, uh, the future of humanity. Um, we know that we're in trouble. We don't have a trivial problem. We have a very significant problem with biodiversity loss around the world, and uh, uh, probably most of the people on this call are well acquainted with, with these kinds of numbers. But the uh, the reason for that, first and foremost, is habitat destruction, and, and precarious um, do the best job at alleviating uh, habitat destruction because they simply protect it. We have this mix. We have this bad news mix. We're seeing a decline. In this case, this shows decline of of four taxa um, than a red list index. Um, if if you're one, everything is fine, and if you're at zero, you're extinct. So the curves show a, you know a gradual drift downward um, for for the main taxa on on the planet. This comes from Global Biodiversity Outlook three. This this is bad news. On the other hand, um, this is going to be completely exacerbated by climate change, in which we're really just starting into this uh, this issue of of climate change. So we have a major problem on our hands, and in organizing the World Parks Congress, we want to make a difference to these kinds of problems. We don't want to just have another Congress of of thousands of people getting together. Um, uh, enjoying each other's company and talking to each other about conservation, but we want to make this a real outreach. We want to make this an outreach beyond the traditional conservation community. So the good news is we've had this enormous growth in protected areas, as shown by, shown by this curve. This has probably been the greatest land use change in in the history of humanity. Um, that we, we're, we're, we have agreed to um, set aside a, a large chunk of our pl of our planet for nature, and the thing we're going to talk about at the Congress is what should be our ultimate targets. How much sh how much ultimately should we should we set aside if we're going to have a sustainable planet? Clearly, the disjunct now between how much we've set aside. In this case, we're around 13% of the planet set aside, and uh, but we're still seeing this, uh, this biodiversity decline. So the theme of Congress is uh, is people, parks, and planet, inspiring solutions. You can see the logo there. I think it's a real cool logo. 
This is going to be in Sydney in uh, in November in in 2014. Uh, and and it's it's trying to position protected areas within the goals of economic and community well-being. So it's mainstream protected areas. It's trying to increase understanding of their vital role in conserving biodiversity and delivering ecosystem services, and demonstrating how this can be preserved. Three elements are parks, and obviously we need to strengthen policy and action commitments around parks and think about their expansion and think about ecological connectivity. But we're also talking about other elements where people are absolutely part of the equation. Um, parks have to be met in ways that benefit people, that uh, have equitable governance, um, that increasingly in include uh, local communities and indigenous peoples uh, as as part of this solution, and that'll be a huge theme at the Congress. And, and finally, the the planet, and this really goes back to the mainstreaming of of protected areas into into the larger agenda as natural solutions to global challenges. So the eight streams that are being organized in the World Parks Congress, if you attend, and I hope you will attend. Uh, you will be able to follow um, these particular streams. In today's call, we're really going to focus on one and eight, on reaching conservation goals and inspiring a new generation. But um, we're, we're, we're talking about these other elements as well, broadening governance, uh, respecting indigenous and traditional knowledge and culture, supporting human life, responding to climate change, improving health and well-being. And, and cross-cutting through those streams, so there will be some cross-cutting themes uh, to deal with the, the increasing crisis we have in the marine world, uh, to talk about world heritage and its conservation, capacity development so we can do this, and, and new governance models and social compacts for protected areas. So I'm going to now turn to stream one. And uh, the stream one, stream one is the one that uh, myself and colleagues are, are working on organizing, and it's on reaching conservation goals. And we've built this around the CBD strategic plan and, and the AACHI targets. Um, when I travel through the U.S. and, and even in, in, in Canada, there's not a good understanding of, of these AACHI tar targets, partly because the U.S. is the one country in the world that, that's not a formal part of the CBD, although they're very active part of the CBD. But we've committed globally to reaching the IACHI targets. There's 20 of them. Here, here is an example of a few of them, for example. For example, target one is, is that to radically raise the awareness uh, of, of the globe about the value of biodiversity. Um, target 15, for example, is to restore 15% of the grid lands. And, and notice these are all time bound by 2020. One we're focusing on in in, in stream one is is grid eleven. Um, so countries of the world have agreed that we will move from seen to at least seventeen percent of terrestrial and from where we now are at about one percent of marine areas to ten percent by two thousand and twenty. And we're gonna do it in ways that um, focus areas of a particular importance for biodiversity. We're going to move to effective and equitably managed areas because about 40% of our protected areas are not now well managed. They're so-called paper parks. Ecologically represented and, and well connected. This is a huge challenge if you part out this, this target. Um, and that's the challenge we're going to take on directly in, in target one. So we are now well, this is the this is the map of the global protected area uh, network, and if you look at this kind of metric um, uh, globally, we are all the pink areas are where we're still under 10% protection. And that includes much of Canada and the United States, for Alaska and the Rocky Mountain areas, for example. And we've got huge challenges through Asia and India, parts of South America and Australia. Because if we're going to uh, embedded in this target is we're going to get to 17% in each of these eco regions, and we have a long way to go. And the graph of that long way to go looks like this: we're now and we have to get here. 
So we want this Congress to be a real boost to to Target 11, and and for countries to to move towards uh, that level of conservation. We want to highlight great success stories, and there's many of them in the world as kind of beacons of hope. Um, because we won't do this with a gloom and doom message. We need hopeful messages. And I'm going to go through just very quickly two examples of really hopeful messages. Here in Costa Rica, they've developed a national biological corridor program for connectivity. Uh, Costa Rica had a problem with declining forest um, in, in, its, in, in the country. They've been able to turn that around. From a, from a low in the late 80s to uh, to increasing forest cover, and the way able to do that is they have a big plan. Um, the hatched areas are, are are protected areas in Costa Rica. The green areas are areas that they want to have ecological connectivity between the protected areas. So how would you do that in in a you know, fairly a highly populated country like Costa Rica. Well, they're actually paying for ecological services. They actually pay people to manage lands so it meets either reforestation or their protection or their restoration objectives. Um, I, I, I don't have time to go into the details, but you can see the, the length of contract and the amount they're paying per hectare to farmers for solution. And the way they're they're doing it is a penny a pump at the at the gas station. So they're linking um, they're linking their economy to ecological conservation solution. Here's another solution in an area that was considered to be hopeful. It's one of the most biodiversity the um, hotspot areas in the world, the Sumatran lone rainforest in Indonesia, um, and, and all this island of Sumatra had been allocated to forest releases, the whole thing. Um, wildlife Fund had predicted that, uh, that the forest would be gone by 2014. But some creative people basically said, okay, they, they, got, they got the regulation changed in the country, and they actually bid for the forest concession. But instead of cutting the trees down, they, they are restoring the area and uh, they're using the carbon the increase in carbon through ecological restoration uh, and and selling it on the on the red market so that they're able to uh, show great biodiversity gains in these places by by innovative innovative techniques um, this led to a, a number of new jobs uh, change in the governance uh, system of the area um, they've done it in integration with international NGOs, like in this case BirdLife International and the Royal Society for the Protection of Birds. But um, it shows you the kind of innovation that can be done that's going to lead to successful conservation. In, in their one forest release, their first one, they've got 170 green jobs. The local villages are running tree nurseries. Um, they've planted 5 million trees, and uh, they're seeing a huge biodiversity response with tigers and wild dogs and apers, for example, all going up. So I'll highlight these kinds of conservation success stories. Here's local marine, managed marine protected areas in, in the Pacific uh, as a way to uh, give people hope and also to spur countries towards conservation goals. The legacy is that we rebrand protected areas as new solutions to global problems, no old ideas, but new solutions. We want to bring in other values like carbon and watersheds and flood control and whatnot. And we certainly want to move to connectivity conservation and uh, and spur more and larger uh, protected areas uh, to meet to meet Target 11. The IUCN is used as natural solutions. We see protected areas as natural solutions to many of the global problems. We're highlighting many of those, the role that uh, protected areas play in the global carbon cycle, for example. Um, uh, and uh, if you just look at how, how much carbon is being protected in existing protected areas, uh, right now that's in situ carbon that can't go into the atmosphere and we're in real trouble. Um, 
protected areas are playing a fundamental role there. Protected areas are playing a fundamental role in water security. About a third of the major cities depend on water from protected areas for, for their domestic water, uh, for example, and, and many more for agriculture. So the measures of success of our, our Congress will be that we will we will reach these targets that will implement, in, implement solutions will develop more global capacity to do this, uh, change policies, and, and really establish a, a legacy. So we hope to see many people in Sydney. We, we want to make this a global event. We want to make a buzz around um, the event. And uh, we look forward to, uh, to seeing the people on call uh, there, for example. So thanks very much. Thanks, Stephen. Now what we will do is take questions both for you and for the next two speakers after they have their presentations. But I just want to say that uh, there are a number of people on this call who are very interested in mechanisms for expanding the pace and the quality of global protected areas uh, as, as conservation professionals, as finance professionals, as people interested in the legal ramifications of protected land. There are a number of different disciplines that are be required to to reach the very ambitious goals that you've outlined here and, and we appreciate your giving us insight into to what the into the global aspirations for us are. Now let me turn to Chris Valentino and, and Elaine Sao. Uh, what they're going to talk about that directly relates to one of the goals that Stephen just articulated, which is developing capacity in the next generation for taking these efforts well into the 21st century. Uh, Chris is working at the Murray Center, uh, where she is the Director of Programs and Communications. The Murray Center is uh, located within Grand Teton National Park, which is a iconic national park in the United States, at the historic Murray Ranch, which fashions itself as conservation's home. She's done a tremendous job at helping to communicate with students in fields related to conservation and young people around the world about uh, this conference and about the uh, areas facing the conservation community. She will be joined by Elaine Sow. Elaine is the chair of the IUCN's uh, WCPA, which is uh, World Commission on Protected Areas, I believe, and we have a young professional specialist group, which Elaine is deeply involved in. She is currently a student, a PhD student at the University of British Columbia, and is a Lou Scholar at the Lou Institute for Global Issues there. Uh, Elaine is uh, with us. Um, there's there's a little bit of complication in her connection, so we may have a little verbal back and forth about uh, changing slides. Let me uh, initially uh, click over to uh, to Krista. Krista, good morning. Are you there? I am. Uh, let me ask you what I asked Stephen, which is how to get turned on to this field, and and then uh, have you. Uh, if you've answered that question, launch into your presentation and, and try to pass it to Elaine verbally when you're ready, and we'll try to keep up with your verbal commands. Oh, we'll do our best. And Elaine, are you there as well? I think so. Can you hear me? We hear you, Elaine. Uh, your your okay. voice is very clear. Great. Well, well um, thank you. Good morning. From from Jackson, Wyoming, and um, I guess to answer your question, um, as it was probably pretty traditional as well. As, um, growing up in a family that just always enjoyed traveling and the outdoors, and um, really appreciated being out in in there. Um, and I went to school actually, not sure what I really wanted to do as a career path. Um, figured if I was able to read or and speak and write. Besides, okay, so I went to the school for communications um, and kind of fell into my current role at the Muir Center, um, slightly and 
Um, and, and I did it, it all kind of clicked of some some pins and some interests that I had when I was growing up. Um, and and it, it fell into place pretty, pretty easily. Um, so, so probably not unlike a lot of people out there who are going to school right now that um, don't realize what they want to do their lives, but um, are, are looking for at least some sort of interest to follow. Um, and I guess, Elaine, do you want to answer that question as well before we launch in? Sure. Uh, I, I, I have a, a, you know, I'm in the suburbs of Silicon Valley in California, you know, home of Apple computers and Cupertino. So I grew up with a lot of technology in me. Um, but we still had the foothills and some natural spaces around us and lived, never lived so far from the coast. I went to undergrad for international economics and then did um, my languages and cultures. And until after I graduated that I was sort of looking for more fulfilling work. My job in LA doing, you know, celebrity marketing and licensing and moved to Costa Rica to volunteer in their national park program. And I started to work in the national parks and in different um, wildlife rehabilitation centers and you know, did the, the sort of turtle nesting projects on the beaches and then came back and realized that that's what I wanted to do was work with protected areas. And then I went to to environmental law school for that. And that's how I got involved. Very good. Uh, that and, and I think, Krista, you're first up with the uh, slides from the presentation. And um, there will be a little back and forth throughout the presentation, um, but we'll try to get as clean as possible. Uh, so, when I um, connected at the 10th World Wilderness Congress Block 10 um, this past October, and we're speaking about inspiring a new generation both during the World Parks Congress, but also um, before, during, and beyond, and what that looks like. Um, part of our, our presentation is going to be talking about um, what the new generation of conservation is, what it looks like, and how to actually make it happen, how to make it come to fruition. Um, so we believe that a um, new generation includes a new ge generation of youth and young people, a new generation of conservation, and all generations together. Vision for inspiring a new generation. Um, essentially, we believe that the majority of the population of the world today is is 30 and under, about half. Um, so this makes 30, 35, and under group significant a significant group not as a future generation but as a living breathing force of great potential here out today um, voices need to be heard your stories need to be told experiences shared and to get them involved in um, a decision making capacity um, our generation of conservation um, is often more inclusive diverse and native um, and create the platform to empower youth involvement in change. It includes in politics and policy making, financial power, decision making, um, recognized knowledge systems, et cetera. And so we think that this, uh, this is bring together all generations in collaboration to co-design solutions uh, to our social and ecological challenges, learning, sharing ideas, sharing legends and knowledges between the young and the old, the experienced and the new, um, and co-creating a shared vision of a wild and protected planet. So basically what we're saying is we need a new generation of conservation. That the ways that what this looks like, um, a few ways you, you accomplish this is you need to empower people to work in their own homes, in their own communities. Um, for a lot of people, it's where they connect to, it's what they're proud of, it's what they know. We can inspire and empower people to start small, because a lot of times when you ask people to make a change or be a part of change, um, it's very overwhelming. So if we could start small, in your backyards, in your own families and homes, and slowly uh, grow that circle so that it encompasses 
um, communities, um, cities, towns, and then grows to states and, and grows to countries and regions. Um, where we 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 envision um, a, a completely inclusive um, a web series, spider web that. Um, small communities and people we can get involved in making small changes, the larger uh, total change where we would be able to make. Um, we also think that the messaging, as um, Stephen said, needs to be exciting, inspiring, and optimistic. Um, we fall into a world where it's all doom and gloom, and the news is always about um, misfortunes that are happening in the world. We think this burns people out before they've even begun to get involved. So we need to remind people that there are people that are doing great work. And the work that they're doing is making a difference. We need them a voice. We need action. We need excitement. Um, we need to have a positive message and showing. And we need to show people that working for Wilder World is fun and is meaningful. We message it in a way that says, "I want to be a part of that." that. Um, there are things that we can learn both from the elder and the younger. Co-learning, as I mentioned earlier. We should learn from older people who have been working to inspire a new generation for some time, who have experience. Um, we can ask them what works, what doesn't work. But we also need to look and work, um, listen to the people who are new to fields, who have wise and are um, green and are looking at problems with fresh thoughts and fresh ideas. Um, and we figure out how we can better support youth to be engaged and give them the ability to to speak um, and have opportunities to share these thoughts as well. Um, we also believe that innovation is going to be what changes our world. And when different generation and different ideas come together, this is when innovation occurs. We need to share knowledge between generations as a key element, as an innovative approach to conservation. Um, we may have different ways of seeing things, but we all have something to learn from each other. And we need to remember that peer to peer, generation to generation, and culture to culture, um, we'll be able to better create solutions for the future. And innovation doesn't always mean that we do things differently from before. There's a lot to learn from indigenous traditions. Um, where innovation lies in mainstreaming something that has long been silenced or marginalized. If we bring nations together in collaboration to co-design solutions to our social and ecological challenges, uh, whole learning and sharing ideas, language, and knowledges between young people and more experienced people, um, we can co-create a shared vision for a wild and protected planet. So I pass this off to you to talk about the young professionals group that you are co-vice chairing. Okay, um, so the, the International Union for the Conservation of Nature um, had a number of expert commissions. One is the World Commission on Protected Areas. And in around 2008, and actually starting before that, it sort of began the move towards this idea of trying to develop a regeneration of conservation within its own commission or within its own networks. Um, so they started to bring in younger members through what they were setting as a young professional specialist group. And that's the group that I work with. It's members 35 and under who are working with protected areas in a number of different capacities. So it's just us, um, protected areas, rangers, or wardens, or scientists. A lot of our members are actually um, come academia, there are students, there are young professors or teachers, leaders in their communities, indigenous representatives or non-native representatives. They come at this from a really wide range of approaches, including through social media and through, through photojournalism or through science or not at all. Um, and so this is sort of our opportunity within the IUCN and the World Commission on Protected Areas to sort of new generation of conservation. This is a really diverse and pluralistic group of people. It's 
not your traditional conservationists in a lot of ways and in a lot of places. And they're really doing new and innovative things in their own communities and all over the world. Um, so back to and one of the we've been working with really closely, as you know, with um, my work uh, with Krista is you know, teaming up with other young groups. So if you want to talk a little bit about Coalition Wild. So one of the projects um, that I've been working on closely is Coalition Wild. It's a collaborative project between the New Center, the organization that I represent, um, the Wild Foundation, who was the, um, co the lead organizer for the 10th World Wilderness Congress, and Sanjay Jackson, who is the founder of the Spirit Bear Youth Coalition. And Wild is a movement of rising leaders uh, to create a, creating a wilder world. It, we Coalition Wild is focused as a social an inclusive social movement um, that focuses on the power of a younger generation to initiate change. Um, we have a platform, an online platform for innovative ideas and provide and we're providing a source of inspiration on the hopes that the movement will hide how connected we are to each other, how connected we are to nature, and how people in nature will thrive together. We provide tools, resources, and connections to initiate change in communities and offer a platform um, to host innovative ideas and on the project. The site will be set to launch in um, another week or so. On the website, um, it will highlight projects from around, around the world from young people who are making changes in their communities or their countries. Um, as I had mentioned earlier, a lot of our information today is talking about how this generation, this younger generation, is disengaged and um, apathetic. And I, Coalition Wild, believe that this is completely wrong, that there are other people around the world doing great work, and the work that they're doing is making a difference. So we want to give the people a voice. We want to get them connected to other young people who are also in great work or want to do great work as the as a stepping stone um world how um it is possible to make change in your community. Um, so the site basically gives voice and showcases um the work um currently we have sixteen different projects up there. Um, and that will continually be expanding um as we continue to talk to more and more young people from around the world. Um, these people, um, and I'll, I'll run through Cle, um, some of the examples of young people around the world making a difference. Um, one of the best one is Sun Jackson, um, he's the founder of the Spirit Bear Youth Coalition, which, it, which is a six million member youth coalition that he started at the age of 13. And um, was set up to, it was designed to save the white Cody bear, the spear bear, in um, British Columbia. Yeah. And it's worked. Simon's now 21, uh, 31, months, excuse me. So we've almost two decades um, to protect this bear. And although the the spear is not safe, it is safe. And um, he helped to lead one of the largest land protected uh, measures in North American history. Um, he is named Magazine's Hero for the planet, uh, one of the top 100 guardians for the earth as well, um, next to Jane Dahl and a lot of other well-known conservationists. Um, Joel Kumar is a Coalition Wild Ambassador and is currently on the Coalition Wild Coordinating Committee, and he's working at India. He's 21 years old um, and working to bring wild conservation to the forefront in India. And is helping to support, start um, a, a Country wide uh, conservation movement throughout India to get people more involved in um, more sustainable, uh, such as fishing, fishing practices or um, protecting their wild lands. Mike Rover is 31 years old. He works in South Africa, um, helping to protect the rhinos through the use of technology. He's built. A, um, he works on the Sabisan game. Reserve, <clears throat> excuse me, which is under threat of rhino poachers for the rhino horn. He has developed an, an app or a smartphone app to help better make 
streamed information from um, one part of, of a million acre reserve to the other, so that they so that um, detectors of the rhino are better able to communicate to help um, combat the poach and their efforts to trying to kill the rhino. Bruno Monteferi works in Peru. He is um, has started a, a movement called Conservatos por Naturaleza, um, and his campaign, which was started in 2012, um, is a tool where individuals can join a social movement in the state of Wilder, Peru. Those involved in the campaign have already visited 30 conservation spots connected with 1,200 volunteers, 25 documentaries, um, all to bring recognition to the conservation efforts throughout Peru. And the final one I'll talk about is Esperanza, uh, Esperanza Sancho, who's six years old um, in Spain, and she's working on a project called Mini Reservas, which are new reservations, uh, wildlife reservations, green spaces, all around um, Spain and working to uh, rewild them and then empowering communities to, to, to take them personally and match them um, and bring back flora and fauna and, um, and, and, and um, document the different uh, species that come kind of a, in a sense of bio blitz for all of these many connected greens across Spain that also help um, with migratory paths for a lot of different insects and wild life. Um, and I'll really pass over to you for the last two as well. Um, so Daniel Bardil and Joseph Ngubwari are both um, members of the WCPA Young Professionals Group and what we've been doing is much like what Coalition Wild is doing is, is to share a lot a lot of the work and experiences of the young professionals so that people know what they're doing and where they're working and what, what's been working for them. Um, Daniela Bargim has a really, uh, her work in Costa Rica is really fascinating. She's been working with local fishing and marine conservation cooperatives um, in a town called Tarcolas with an organization called Coop de Solidar. Um, she's been working with a lot of the young fishermen folks from across Mesoamerica as well, so in other countries outside of Costa Rica, to actually bring them together physically as well as over um, line to their experiences, and including many of the really difficult challenges that they face, including marine pollution, over-extraction from industrial shrimping and fishing, drug trafficking and drug addiction. Um, it affects a lot of the young and older people, lack of jobs within the community that creates um, one of the communities, and including even the threat of um, a government designation of a marine protected area that would block livelihood or subsistence resource access by these traditional communities. It also gives them a really good opportunity to share their successes, um, including the community fisheries monitoring programs that they've um, set up that have been producing baseline studies as well as data that shows that under community fishery management, the fish stocks have been coming back. And this is a place where there's complete absence of government data. Um, they've also you know, been growing community fishing cooperatives that allow the social and economic benefits to states communities and benefits benefit everyone across the community. Um, Joseph's work in Uganda is also really, really admirable. Um, he's been, he was originally working with the Institute of Tropical Forest Conservation, Bwindi, in Pebble National Park, which is most famously known for its um, hosting some of the world's remaining families of mountain gorillas. Um, and he at Murchison Falls National Park working to curtail or mitigate the impacts on the environment and wildlife from oil gas exploration and extraction in the Albertine Grounds. Um, Wayne, um, this is Jim. I just want to interrupt to say that you and Krista have three or four minutes to wrap up because I want to leave time for, uh, for questions from the audience. So if we get through the rest of the slides in a couple of minutes, that would be great. Okay. Um, just 
the last bit on Joseph that I would add is that, you know, the work that he's doing is in a really important transboundary um, protected area network between Uganda, Rwanda, and DRC. Um, and just going on to the next slide. Um, so this, what we've been working together on is trying to sort of bring together mm -hmm. all of these amazing young people um, and young professionals uh, to sort of give a platform to share their stories and to make an impact in the protected areas and conservation world through the World Parks Congress. Um, Parks Congress has had, had very specific goals um, in terms of creating a legacy known as the Sydney Promise with protected areas as food for the planet, for people, and then things that benefit parks themselves. And a big legacy objective for the World Congress is capacity building, which is, is interesting for young people um, who are interested in building their skills and sharing their skills. Um, just quickly on to the next one. So the, the Young Professionals Group, the WCP, um, um, is involved in, uh, as a co-leader in one of the a new generation. Um, next one, the key objectives. This stream is basically looking to empower the growth of a dynamic global movement to experience the inspired by value and conserve nature to reach new audiences whether it's young or old, um, older, and them to connect with their natural world. Um, it's to, as I mentioned, create a platform for a lot of the young um, and emerging protected areas and conservation leaders of the world, allow them to share their stories and to, uh, and to come together to develop greater collaboration and inspire others through their work. Um, and that involves coming together to create a young people Path for um, for parks, people, planet. And this is basically a statement or a declaration by young people speaking who we are, what concerns, what our vision, and what are we plan to do about that in terms of act actions. And then creating a global campaign that's bringing more youth out into nature. Um, different program components that the Young professionals group, along with its different sort of young people's um, works like the Coalition Wild, um, are to develop a capacity building workshop that will take place for a week before the Congress. It brings young people together all over, from all over the world to share their experiences, to skill share, and to bring a powerful message to the World Parks Congress. That's the that being the young people's path. Um, the young people will be selected through. A people's challenge. Um, this is on a lot of ways like the the world challenge that took place at the World Wilderness Congress. So people submitting their stories of what they're doing and then um, action process through that, and then allowing a lot of people, um, younger people, to showcase their work at the World Parks Congress and to share their stories, and also to bring in new and innovative ways that young people are, are sharing the messages of conservation in protected areas, so including through technology forum, um, and there's been talk about doing a hackathon to get a lot of technology people to be activated live at the World Parks Congress around conservation, and including a conservation incubator and, and other, other sort of ways that maybe haven't always been connected with conservation that, and inviting them into the World Parks Congress to actually support conservation. Um, there's also a group being there as a media coalition that will specifically bring voices to the World Parks Congress to provide media coverage from a younger people's perspective in different languages and on online platforms that are available all over the world. And part of this also is to really um, change in the generation of conservation, and this includes through intergenerational dialogues on really critical issues, conservation issues, and on the new social compact, which is 
a, an attempt to sort of bring together different types of stakeholders, including the extractive industries and the, and the consumer industries, to come together and say, how can we live together on this planet in harmony with nature? And what we're doing to young people to the Congress includes approaches to fundraising. And in a lot of ways, this idea of living a new economy, maybe um, not going through the old avenues of, of big donors or corporate donors and censorship, but through much more community-based fundraising, crowdsourcing, or you know, bringing on local artists and musicians to do benefit events, etc. Um, and we're just going on to the next slide. You know, make all of this happen, and it's because it's a lot to do. Um, we are working with a number of, of really strong partners, including Park Canada, um, IUCN Commission for Education and Communication, and the IUCN Intergenerational Partnership for Sustainability, and reaching out to other young people groups um, over the world to see young people in the community so that they can then turn after the World Parks Congress back to their own communities to support their community in new ways and to build broader networks of young people and intergenerational partnerships all over the world. Um, and lastly, on just how can we be involved or get involved with this, you know, we want to invite everyone on this webinar who, you know, who are interested in any way to help us by um, in the co-creation and connecting with our networks and help inspire others. Um, I think that you know we're on time, so I'll let me, the webinar participants read this and not go through it in too much detail. But you know, it's it's a lot of you know, getting involved in the different program components that I've mentioned, and then helping us carry this forward, as Krista has mentioned, being the World Parks Congress and into our new lives in our communities, on the ground, into the protected areas, and even the, even the areas that aren't protected yet and could, you know, benefit from a more harmonious relationship between people and nature. Okay. Uh, Elaine and Krista, thank you very much. That's a, a very ambitious agenda, and we're going to see different ways we can help you uh, complete that. We have a couple of questions already from the audience uh, that I have in the chat box and in the Q&A box that you all have been provided online. Let me uh, ask a couple of those, and I'm going to extend the time period since we're on the web to about 12.10 or 12.15 so that we can get a little bit of a dialogue going. The first one is from Frank Popper uh, from Rutgers and Princeton University, who's, who's uh, well known for his uh, Fighting on the Buffalo Commons and a, and a very thoughtful guy who asked a fairly interesting and provocative question. Uh, compared to other countries, is the United States especially resistant to large parks and other protected reserves? And if so, why? And I will add to that, uh, we begin to address that and. Um, uh, take action. So I will open that to all three of you, Stephen and Krista, and you may or may not agree with the question that he offered in his question. Who is swing? Perhaps I'll start, uh, Jim, if I can. Yeah, please. Uh, the, I, I don't think the United States is especially resistant. No. Um, you know, we, we've we have a global uh, a global challenge in in creating these protected areas. The United States was, uh, you know, arguably the initiator of the modern protected areas movement with the start of Yellowstone. Although there's many 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 precursors of that in in different cultures around the world. Um, uh, Jim Carter is legendary for for the setting aside of Alaska. Um, uh, Jibu is used his legislative powers to set aside an enormous marine protected area in the northeast Hawaiian Islands. So I don't think there there's special resistance. Uh, there's a challenge, and uh, you know the United States is probably the most litigious country in the world. It's probably a fair thing to say. And 
making these decisions in a country like the United States is an extremely difficult one. But there is lots of uh, innovation going on, especially on the private protected area front, which is another kind of governance. And this is an area we could have a whole webinar on, but there is more initiative on private protected areas going on in the United States than in any single country in the world. So, Stephen, could I ask you to add on to that and say how, how in the context of your stream, uh, stream one at the World Parks Congress next year, uh, the, the issue of private parks uh, or private land conservation uh, is, is going to be introduced? Uh, within stream one, we're going to have, have we're going to focus on two governance types which have probably been under profiled. Um, one one on private and and one on indigenous and community conserved areas. Um, uh, to a certain extent, globally, governments are running out of gas a little, little bit in terms of setting up protected areas. But um, the energy for new protected areas is coming from other governance models. Uh, certainly, indigenous and community conserved areas, and certainly private protected areas. So we're going to profile those and some of the stories uh, and solutions and lessons learned um, so other countries can pick them up. Chris, and Elaine, do you have anything to add to that about the uh, question about the United States? All right, I will take... Uh, yeah. Yeah. I, I think that the question is... It, it, as it, it has come from, from an interesting perspective, and I would say, you know, what would you make the USA? Um, you know, and I think that when you look at this from any one stakeholder perspective, then, yeah, it becomes hard. Um, but I feel connectivity, conservation is difficult if it's only one member group that's involved in trying to push across many different types of stakeholders, an idea that needs to help every so if you're looking at, you know, the U.S. government, they not supportive of large landscape scale conservation. I wouldn't say that they're not supportive, but it's very hard for them to act alone. Um, this is, you know, this is in a totalitarian country where they can actually see what happens across all of the lands. And so it needs to involve a lot of private stakeholders. And that's the new generation of conservation that, you know, inspired a new generation is trying to get at is that we can't just be the conservation world acting alone with protected areas or just the government's acting alone with protected areas. It needs to be all people, all peoples come together or we, we can't achieve that kind of moral vision, I, I think. Well said, well said. Um, Gary Bowen has a question which uh, is as follows. Protected areas necessarily involves reducing human impact through altering their daily behavior. Uh, that is a functional definition of sustainability, he notes. How is this dealt with as future or intergenerational uh, methods are applied to achieve change? I hope that question made sense to you, but uh, I'll try to boil it down to uh, how are we working through the WPC to begin to get people to uh, their daily lives so as to live sustainably and, and help uh, conserve assets for future generations. I, I, I'll take a at that, uh, at least initially. I think it's very, it, it's very clear that, that um, protected areas uh, have some impact on their use. Uh, they're, they're protected. The, the first priority has to be nature conservation. There are, uh, that said, um, there are often, not always, but often, human win situations. I'm here at a marine um, uh, workshop, a marine protected areas workshop in Annapolis, and many of the outcomes from, when, if you set up a no-take marine protected area, yes, you can't fish in that protected area, and that does impact people, but overall fishing effort regionally is, is most often increased. You're actually, if you if you protect, if you have a no-take area, really you catch more fish. Uh, so so there are there are huge opportunities 
um, in setting up uh, protected areas. Um, and the benefits from protected areas are huge. You have to do a full cost accounting. If we set protected areas up to store carbon or to um, provide water, um, you, you have to look at you have to look at the whole benefits package versus the cost package. Um, Gary makes a good point. There are costs, but sustainability is a larger um, a larger scale question. All right, very good. Uh, let, me, let me ask one more question, Stephen, since I've got you on the line. Durley Gonzalez, I believe I'm pronouncing that name correctly, asks, where and how do we access the resources and document that Stephen mentioned in his presentation? For example, how do we get access to Stream 1 uh, documents as they become available? There's a World Parks Congress website. Um, I haven't been on it in the last week or so, but uh, that is, that's a key place to go for information, uh, specifically on the Congress. If you're interested specifically in the kinds of things that IUCN and the World Commission on Protected Areas of the IUCN are doing, there are hundreds of thousands of documents on the on the uh, on the IUCN website. And go if you just Google WCPA, um, you will you will see a whole library of information uh, on on guidance documents, uh, reference documents to what a protected area is, how it should be managed, different governance types. There's a brand new uh, great pre great portion on uh, on governance models. So uh, those, those are the places I'd go. As, the, as we get closer to the WPC in November of 2014, uh, documents relevant to the agenda and some streaming uh, sources, I think, are going to be made available on the website for the World Parks Congress. Is that correct? That's right. I Again, I haven't been on in the last week. The registration might be open right now for the World Parks Congress. It was it was okay. going to be very soon. And uh, there will be increasingly a rich document uh, load available uh, on the website. Elaine and, and Krista, let me, let me close by asking you, what's the best way for people who are either listening to this live or who will listen to this later on in a recorded version to get to access the UCN WCPA Young Professional Specialist Group or the whole community of uh, young professionals and students that you're hoping to engage in the field of, of biodiversity conservation? So I there. Will... Oh, I'm sorry. Yeah, okay. This is me. Um, I, would, I would really invite everyone, as Stephen mentioned, visit World Parks Congress website, worldparkscongress.org, but also visit the IUCN um, Young Journals page on the WCPA website um, and can get involved by either joining a professional specialist group directly and um, taking on leadership roles through that, um, through this group, or in joining, you know, our, our allies, sort of coalition files or you know, the other professionals out there, or just getting in contact with um, stream leaders of Inspiring a New Generation, which include myself and my email address is on the PowerPoint, um, or my co-vice chair, Sudeep Jana, whose email is also on the PowerPoint, and um, any others that are listed on the World Parks Congress website. There's also an email address, wpcgenerations at iucn.org, and that will send an email to all of the stream leaders of Inspiring a New Generation. And interest in getting involved, uh, what that what that involvement means for them, then that reaches all, all of us. So young professionals and students who want to get involved in this don't necessarily have to be affiliated with a member of the IUCN government or a member NGO to be able to join your group. Is that correct? Correct. Yeah. Okay. So it's open to, to anyone who wants to get involved. All right, so um, I, I want to close this by uh, thanking Krista, Elaine, and Stephen for their participation, uh, wishing them the opportunity over the next year to get just a little bit 
of sleep because they've got a tremendous amount of work to do to continue to prepare for the WPC. And then I also want to thank all of the participants who are in this session and who I hope are encouraged to think about contributing to uh, the, the voice that will come out of the World Works Congress and also for the academics and students online considering sending in an essay to to our call for papers, uh, which is available at conservationcatalysts.org, www.conservationcatalysts, with an S, dot org, uh, and you'll see uh, an announcement of the call for papers so that we can bring four or five additional exceptional young people uh, to this global gathering. With uh, I will be all a, a nice afternoon and look forward to talking to you in the new year.